Best with me here in the studio because April is National Donate Life Month. So we're talking about organ and tissue donation. Let me introduce you to who we're talking to today. I'm talking with Latrice Price from the organization uh, Donate Life, as well the assistant director of the ED CMS Safe Programs at GBMC. Monica Getz is also joining us, a nurse and an ambassador for organ donation, really at GBMC as well. And I'm also speaking today with Danette Reagan, who is an organ recipient <laughs> and is excited to talk about it and tell people some of the benefits of uh, organ donation. But a lot of people have questions about being an organ donor. Uh, Latrice, what does it mean and how important is it for people to make sure that they have you know, signed up to be a donor and also spoken with their families about yes. that? So um, this month, April is National Donate Life Month and we use this time to um, spread awareness all over the state of Maryland. Um, it's very important for people to sign up to become an organ donor by going to the MBA, having that discussion with your family. Currently in Maryland, there are close to 3,400 people waiting for a life-saving organ transplant. 3,400 people? Yes. Now, what does the Living Legacy Foundation do here in Maryland specifically? Living Legacy is what's called an organ procurement organization. It's 58 organizations like Living Legacy around the country, and we're basically responsible for saving lives is, is the, the short of it. When someone goes to one of the transplant centers to be listed for a life-saving organ, transplant living legacy is the one to to go and ask someone's loved one once they the hospital's done everything they can to take care of them to ask their loved one for them to become an organ donor if they haven't designated themselves have you done that specifically with with people um, no, no, that's not my role. I talk to people in the community about signing up, mm -hmm. but we do have a very special staff that do go out and oh. talk to the people about that. And I like to say they have the hardest job in the organization because as you can imagine, um, it's, organ donation is tragic. It's, it's a tragic time. Well, they're meeting people at some of a tough time, some yes. of the worst times in their, in their lives. Exactly. And yet it can be uplifting. Yes, it can be. Mm -hmm. yeah. For those people, wow, that's so important to talk about it. And again, just to mention for the for the folks, is it um, why is it so important to talk about your with your family about your intentions? It's it's nice for your family to know what your wishes are. In Maryland, there's a law that every death that occurs in the hospital gets reported to Living Legacy. And at that point, if a person has not designated themselves as an organ donor, you can um, your family member would um, be the one to make that decision. And we hear families all the time say that if I would have known what my loved one wanted. So having that discussion about your wishes hey mom hey dad I'm an organ donor then in turn they will share what they feel about organ donation and then that way you have that conversation open conversation and you know that if something was to happen to anybody in the family what their wishes are mm -hmm. and at that point it doesn't have to be a difficult discussion I mean it can be something hopeful for the future as well no, it can you can make it fun you can mm -hmm. you know have a, a table discussion I mean with my mom I would joke with her about end of life um, events I'm like hey do you want a flower casket do you want this do you want just so we can have that discussion about end of life because nobody really wants to talk about their death. So, uh, Monica, GBMC, what is uh, the hospital's role in, in organ and tissue donation? Sure. So, you heard that we have um, every call, um, every death actually results in a call to um, Living Legacy to be able to determine if you wanted to be an organ and tissue donor and if we're able to support that wish. Um, my job is to spread awareness throughout the hospital of organ and tissue donation process, what our resources are, and and what, our, what, what the hospital actually does to support these patients and their families. We have um, many resources through Living Legacy where they will actually send someone on site and, and support the families and help them through this very difficult time. Um, and we also try to make it fun. So we do fun activities, not only throughout the month of April, but ongoing, um, where we try to raise awareness. Um, this past month, we did what's called an In One Word campaign, um, where each department within our hospital shared what, what tissue and organ donation means to them um, and then they would sh send the flamingos to the next unit to be able to share their thoughts as well. So just that general awareness um, is really what my role is. Yeah, that's and so you're being an evangelical about getting the word out about organ donation, Absolutely. organ and tissue donation. Uh, but Danette, for you, it's a much more personal uh, issue because you've been through, uh, you're a recipient of, of of organs. Uh, can you talk a little about your experience and what it was like for you? Sure, I can. All eyes shifted this way as soon as you called my name. <laughs> <laughs> I am a two time kidney recipient. That's incredible. First time in 2008, I received a uh, kidney from a deceased donor, um, a family that was traveling through Maryland, and the mom had heart complications. And I thank God that the family said yes. And then in 2016, my 
transplant doctor informed me that my kidney functions were dropping very low and I was went to my family and told them and my kids and my godson decided they would go down with me when the work up and to see if they will match and they all matched so then we had to do process of elimination but my youngest daughter Denisha Whitaker said I don't care who matches I'm gonna give it to her she wanted to do so the first time she was too young and now I've had her kidney for almost two and a half years one of her kidneys mm -hmm. and she's expecting her first baby in June I'm also a three-time donor family my first one is my nephew, Martez Hall. Martez passed away from a senseless act in 2011. The family decided that we were going to say yes to organ donation, and he wasn't able to give his organs, but he's a tissue donor and a cornea donor. The second is Andrew. Andrew passed away last June from heart complications. Because Martez was a donor, Andrew has signed up to become a donor, and also because someone said yes to me when we decided to get in contact with Living Legacy and let them know that we wanted Andrew to become a donor, they called us back and we happily were informed that he is already a donor. Mm -hmm. This past March, the 11th last month, we lost my uncle and he's a donor in spirit. He was a little bit too sick to become an organ and tissue donor. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad to say that someone said yes to me during my time and that allowed my family to see how I was able to interact and become more healthier than what I was before. And now they're starting to say yes to organ donation. As a, as a family member uh, who's lost loved ones, um, does it help to know that part of them lives on in, in, in other people who've gotten that organ donation? Yes, we received letters from Martez's donor. One was a firefighter who was in training and he was injured during training. He said he was in 80% pain all the time and he thought his career was over. But because he received a part of Martez's tissue, at the time we received the letter, he was at 20% pain level. So he could go back to work and go back to training to become a firefighter. So that makes us feel very happy. Also, both of them were cornea donors and we received information from where four individuals received their corneas and there's a joke about Martez because Martez needed glasses and would not wear them. And one of the family members said, you know, that boy was blind as a bat. <laughs> and I said, but someone can see, if not the first time again, just because we said yes. Monica and or Latrice, um, she's talking a lot about the issue of um, tissue donations as well as organ donations. And it's I think it bears repeating that there are people whose lives are going to be improved a lot yes. um, through that gift uh, and, and not just in a life-saving way, but in many times it's just to get a firefighter back training mm -hmm. to be a firefighter. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Yeah, we'd like to say that tissue is life enhancing and actually like one person, like we individually we can save, I mean we can enhance 75 lives with tissue donation and people don't realize that and in organ donation there's another eight to nine lives that you can save with that, so we, could, we have the potential to be able to help 100 people when we die. And um, th that was an interesting story too about, about the, the eyes improvement. The patient in theory beforehand must have been having problems, right? Is that the, the, the issue going forward? Yes, and in this case, they gave the gift of sight four times mm -hmm. over. That's incredible. Um, so someone that couldn't see can now see. And it's, it's mm -hmm. truly the gift mm -hmm. of life, the gift of improved function. It's, it's really incredible. When we hear all this, uh, it, and it just makes sense to, to become an organ donor, do you ever encounter even a little bit of resistance or some people who have some questions or maybe even misconceptions about it oh, um, yes. that you have to, <laughs> can you talk about what, what people might think and how you kind of overcome that with some people? Every single day. <laughs> really? <laughs> we hear the biggest myth that at the hospital, yes. mm -hmm. they're not gonna save my life if I have that heart on my driver's license or that I hear that they're killing African-American boys in the street to take their organs to, to give to rich people. Um, one of the ways we, we help dispel that myth is we let them know that Living Legacy is not at the hospital waiting for you, that it's the hospital's job, it's Monica's job to save your life. They wanna save your life, they don't want you to die. And it's not until they've done everything they possibly can, then they call Living Legacy, which we are down in our beauty, and then we come to whatever hospital that donor is at. 
and evaluate that donor to see if they are um, a potential to be an organ donor because um, not everybody that died can donate organs like Danette shared, um, Montez could not as well as Andrew. They became tissue donors so if you don't if you die in a manner in which you cannot help save lives through organ donation there's always the opportunity to um, help enhance 75 more with tissue donation. So even if a person potentially has health problems maybe they think they can't be a donor. Yeah um, diabetes a lot of people we were just at a big conference Danette and I on um, on Monday where people say oh I'm on medication or I have diabetes I'm HIV I have hep C um, hep C can can donate HIV can donate anybody on um, that's a diabetic or has high blood pressure, they can still be considered for organ donation. So we like to tell people, don't rule yourself out. If this is something you really wanna do, just go ahead and, and, and sign up to become an organ donor and let them decide, the professionals decide that at the time of your death. So, Danette, I, I gotta ask you, before, <laughs> um, when, you, when you started to get sick, mm -hmm. I mean, there's probably not a lot, lot of people who've been through um, that level to the point where an organ donation might be necessary. So what, what does it feel like and how bad was your symptoms? It, w it must have been tough for you back then. Yes, I was working at MedStar Health through the four hospitals, Good Sam Union, Harvard, and Franklin as a blood donor technician. And of course, all of us want to lose weight. I started losing weight rapidly. I thought I was bringing sexy bag. I was sick. I thought I was superwoman. I could do anything that I was doing before, but my coworkers and my supervisors saw that I was getting sick. My supervisors took action and went to employee health to tell them what was going on. Mm -hmm. But at home, when I got off from work, I would come in and I would sit down, 20 minutes, fall asleep, and my husband would say, sleeping beauty, go to your bed. And I said, no, I'm fine. I would not want him to touch me or wake me because I was so exhausted. And that was part of the process because the toxins were taking over my body. My nephrologist said, we can put you on prednisone. No, I was bringing sexy back. I knew prednisone would make me gain weight. I didn't want to do that. I wonder now if I had done it, what it had gotten to that point. But we can't turn back the hands of time. Um, as I stated before, my nephrologist would watch me closely. And those six month visits turned into every two months, maybe every month. I would have to get shots because my blood levels were very, very low. Um, it got to the point where when I would go to church, I would get these hot flashes that felt like bugs were crawling on my skin. And it was the toxins taking over. Wow. At that point, I was pre being prepared so that I can go on dialysis. Um, I did peritoneal dialysis, loved it, but it did not love me. Then I had to do hemodialysis, and I did that for three months before I got my final call to come in and get a kidney transplant. So when, they, when someone tells you, I assume a, a doctor, that, that mm -hmm. this this series of a procedure is going to be necessary. Um, just talk us through how that must have been for you. I develop a very good relationship with my nephrologist and he could tell me straight out anything to let me know that, um, Ms. Reagan, this is what we're gonna have to do next. Anybody else could come in and say to me, you know, Ms. Reagan, you need to do this. If it wasn't him, I didn't wanna hear it. He would tell me what to do next, how to do it, um, he told me how to prepare to put my name down on the transplant list at one of the transplant hospitals, either John Hopkins or University, and I chose University. Um, each step of the way, he wanted to know what I had done, how I had accomplished it. Once I went down to University to put my name on the list, they give you six weeks to complete everything, and it's a list. And I did mine in two because I was determined. I was determined to live and not die. I'm living my best life good, bad, and indifferent days, but my good days outweigh my bad. I look like the epitome of health, but I am a refining process. Um, Monica, do you see <laughs> patients who, I mean, because if, if she was walking down the street, no one would know she was sick, and yet from the description of what it must have been like before, it's, it's a marked change it really after is. the transplant. It really is. We see people at their best and we see people at their worst <laughs> yeah. on both ends of this process. 
and it really is incredible to be to see what a difference it makes but to know in the background how much she's taking to live this best life and how hard it is for her to work to get to this point um, is really really incredible we see the people at their at their worst when we are sending them for that transplant um, and supporting them or when they're or they're not quite there yet um, but they, they see that hope they know it's there and um, and so it's it's really something and it and you also pointed out um, Danette that your daughter was a living donor yes. uh, for you after making that donation uh, she's now gonna have a child yes I mean I think there might be some people who are <laughs> concerned if they're a living donor that it might affect their lifestyle in some way um, it doesn't sound like it's affected her well I don't think it has, you know, when I, the first time I needed a transplant, she was too young, but she wanted to do so. My husband offered first, but he couldn't at that time. But <clears throat> during the second trans need of a transplant, I had three matches, my oldest daughter, my youngest daughter, and one of my godsons. And she said she didn't care which one match, she was going to do it anyway. So um, she's a little over eight months pregnant now. And I think she's the most beautiful person in the world. I think all both of my girls are beautiful. But when I see her carrying life after she extended my life, it makes my heart just flutter. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to cry, but I feel like it. We, we, we <laughs> may. She's going to make us cry, too. <laughs> you'll be, you'll be glad like that grandchild very right? soon. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I do. My oldest daughter gave me a grandson, and I love him dearly. I call him my muddy. He calls me his money. <laughs> and... I love when he comes in the door, he goes, Money, where's Pop Pop? So I'm looking forward to my next grandson coming in the door saying the same thing. I have two fat legs, one for each child. <laughs> well, it's an, it's an example, too, because it's not just saving lives, it's also improving life. You want to live up until your, as long as you can, we hang with the grandkids, yeah. you know? Well, when I first found out I was sick, I prayed and I asked God to allow me to see my children graduate from high school, go to college, start their careers get married, and give me grandchildren by the age of 50. I was 51 when that first grandbaby was Close. born. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was pregnant at the, when I right. was 50, but. <laughs> we have a question, by the way, from uh, one of the viewers who's watching. Uh, La Le Leah uh, is asking if she can donate a kidney to a friend uh, as a living donor. She's on uh, blood thinners. Uh, is that an issue for, uh, for some donors, or is that something that can be either overcome or dealt with going forward? Anybody is able to put it out there that they want to be a donor. Not everyone matches, mm -hmm. though. Um, so there's a process to go through for determining, and so that would have to be something that she wants to make her wishes known. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's testing that goes along with it. And I think that you two probably can speak a little bit to mm -hmm. what that yeah. would look like. She um, she can just go to one, of, if her friend is always listed for a transplant, she can go to whichever transplant center she's listed for. Mm -hmm. And even if she doesn't match her friend, she can donate to someone else, yes. and someone else would mm -hmm. donate to her friend. So, um, oh, wow. yeah, oh, yeah, it's like a chain of donations yes. Yes. that yes. happens, right, to yes. get the matches. Mm -hmm. But what about the uh, issue with the blood thinners? Is that a drug that might interfere with I'm that not, at some I'm point? I'm not or? sure because mm -hmm. the, that will probably be on the transplant side. It would depend on yeah. what it is and what the doctors yeah. are saying. Once you go to be listed, they will go through what process you have to go through mm -hmm. and they will eliminate you at whatever point in time. My husband, when he wanted to donate for me, they asked him did he take blood pressure medication and he said yes and because that was one of my issues as well they wouldn't allow him to donate for me but there are many medications where you will still be able to be a donor even with mm -hmm. them and mm -hmm. they can work around them there's timing especially with things like blood thinners there's certain timing where they'll they'll work with you and say when it's safe to stop when it's safe to restart or they may want to just keep it going mm -hmm. um, so definitely don't exclude yourself because mm -hmm. of a specific mm -hmm. medication or even condition right. because you may be able to make a difference for somebody else even if you have a medical condition even if you yeah. have medical life, conditions absolutely yeah. still possible each case is different yes you've had two kidney donations it was was, was it both uh, or was it one that was done twice the same kidney or was it both kidneys? my original kidneys I still have them they're probably raisins now <laughs> but the first one I received in 2008 mm -hmm. and my donor was much older than I was at that time so it the, my doctor said it ran its course mm -hmm. um, and then in 2016, he informed me that the function level was starting to low because, again, I started losing weight, bringing sexy back. Mm -hmm. So I knew something was going on. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I informed again my family and let them know what was going on and, and the three of them went down to be tested. So I have my second one. I have the first one on the right side, Jane Doe Wright, and the second one is Little Angel after my daughter, Angel. Hmm. And so, hmm. and you've never known what, where the, the, who the person was that donated the first I did one. not, I wrote a letter mm -hmm. and unfortunately the family just did, they just wanted the people to be well. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to have any contact with them. Um, I just wanted to say thank you because my life was extended again so that I could see those things that I named earlier, you know, and again, I gave life to a beautiful baby girl and she extended my life at the age of 24. Well, the first donor must have been a match <laughs> uh, for, oh, yes. for her to come in. And, it, and even though um, it was an older person who wound up mm -hmm. donating, that wound up giving you enough time to, to extend your life. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible mm -hmm. gesture. And during that, that time, I was able to do things such as become an ambassador, mm -hmm. to go out and spread awareness for organ, eye, and tissue donation, to join Team Maryland, and go out and meet millions, I'm going to say, because that's what it feels like, of people from other states at the Transplant Games of America. Um, I'm able to join different organizations through the Living Legacy Foundation, um, the Ethics Committee, TRIO, which is Transplant Recipient Organization, um, international organization, correct? Yes. And um, I have a whole slew of things. Um, Veterans Transplantation Associations, where I'm a chaplain and a board member there. Um, my biggest thing is going out and making sure that other individuals see me. Because I will say to them, if you've never met anyone who received a transplant, you wouldn't know who they are. And have you ever met one? Mm -hmm. And they would say, no, and I say, pleased to meet you. My name is Danette. And then I tell them my testimonial. And just so we're clear, uh, Latrice, is it enough just, most people have the choice on the driver's license yes. when they go in, but is that enough for people to do or do they need to do more? And we just encourage you to having that conversation, having that dialogue about your, um, your wishes. And again, that hopefully that was spark conversation from the other family members, and then you all know what each other want mm -hmm. if something was to happen to you. So not just checking that, that yes on your driver's license is not the only thing you should do. You should also tell your family that's very, very important. That conversation is so important. Yes, we it see is. it all the time. And that really makes families feel supported and empowered during that time because I'm honoring her wishes. I'm doing exactly mm -hmm. what she wanted me to do. Um, and that makes the decision even easier. Mm -hmm. So Monica, we, you've talked about the flamingos a little bit and everything. What's going on tonight? Uh, tonight at we GBC? have our annual um, organ and tissue donor ceremony. So this past year we've had 11 donors in organ tissue or donors in spirit this mm -hmm. past year at GBMC um, and they will come back and we send out invitations, give them the opportunity to have their loved one recognized on our tree of life um, within our um, concourse uh, walking in through the emergency department. We have this beautiful tree of life that has the names of our organ and tissue donors that have chosen to be recognized on that wall over the past two years. Um, so that happens tonight. We have some recipients and donor families coming um, to speak to us and then um, we will recognize, so we present each family with a leaf with their loved one's name on it and then we also hang one on the, on the wall. So if you ever come to GBMC, you'll be able to see our organ and tissue donors and donors in spirit very visibly. Well, it's a nice gesture and it, it's a lot of consolation for some of those families going through a difficult time as well. And it just shows that the, that life goes on Absolutely. for a donor or a recipient who needs an organ or tissue donation. Yes. Incredible. We just recently had somebody reach out to us um, through our um, website because they were Googling like tree of life or something they wanted to do and they your tree came okay. up and they loved it. They, they it's were really like, beautiful. can we talk to somebody about that? We want to do that here. And I don't remember what organization it was, but yeah. it is, it is really a powerful thing to look at. And mm -hmm. um, you actually have the ability to read other stories at a, at the kiosk, um, even donate. You can designate to donate at that kiosk rather than going to the MVA mm -hmm. or getting a new license or waiting. Um, you can do it right there at the tree of life. 
Well, I really appreciate you three coming in. I think it's just been an important discussion and I hope people will get to watch it and think about talking to their family about their intentions of being an organ donor and uh, participating in that. But Latrice Price from the Living Legacy Foundation, thanks so much. Monica thank Getz from GBMC, thank you. And Danette Regan, uh, the Donate Life <laughs> Ambassador. We really appreciate all three of you coming in here this morning. Thank, thank you, thanks, thanks for having us. Thanks, I appreciate so. it. Thanks to you for watching. We're gonna wrap this up here, but uh, we're back next month with another GBMC BMC Facebook Live here at WMAR2, Maryland's first television station.